Hello, welcome to HIV.gov's coverage of the 2022 Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, or CROI for short. I'm Steve Holman, and I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Carl Diefenbach for a conversation about some of the conference highlights on HIV cure research and developments in HIV prevention and treatment. Carl's the director of the Division of AIDS at NIH's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Welcome, Carl. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you today, Steve. And thanks to our viewers for joining us. So Carl, during this first week of CROI sessions, we heard interesting research findings about advances in HIV cure research. One study in particular has made the news. Can you tell us about the case of a woman with HIV who currently has no detectable viral HIV uh, after 14 months, despite no longer being on ART, and what role a stem cell transplant that she had four years ago to treat cancer might play in that? Thanks, Steve. Yes, this is a, the third case of uh, a person living with HIV uh, who was living on antiretroviral therapy and developed a really aggressive form of cancer called AML. And then for the treatment of her cancer, had to undergo a, um, a, a transplant. That's the best way to, to, to essentially cure this type of cancer. So she had a very specific type of transplant, one that used cord blood. Um, and the advantage of cord blood is it, you can determine ahead of time if the cord blood has the particular things that we are looking for when we want to, to reconstitute immunity in somebody who's living with HIV. We want to make those cell. We want those cells that are resistant to HIV infection, and they carry something called the Delta 32 mutation. That's a fancy term for resistant to HIV. Additionally, she had um, other cells uh, that were added to the uh, the, uh, the cord blood because they need a little help. A cord blood is not very much blood if you think about what what that would be. So it, they need some help to engraft, um, and that's called um, a haploidentical transplant. And so the combination of the two had a really great outcome in her. After 100 days, after her conditioning and reconstitution, she was 100% reconstituted um, with her bone marrow, her immune system was back up um, and working. She was then on antiretroviral therapy uh, for another 37 months. Um, fully recovered, and uh, then 14 months ago, she stopped antiretroviral therapy and has been living um, uh, essentially HIV-free, so what we call HIV remission in those 14 months. It's important to think about when, when do you decide somebody is cured versus in remission? Um, and modeling has showed that usually that the general sense is after 30 months in remission, you can declare somebody cured. So she's almost halfway home. Okay. So just to underscore something or to check with you to make sure I understood it, um, when she got the stem cell, when she got the cord blood and stem cell transplant combo, um, the, the transplant surgeon specifically selected um, for transplant, uh, Cord blood and cord blood that has a, a very unique and rare mutation that's actually resistant to HIV. So they deliberately selected that in this case for her. That's exactly right, Steve. Uh, currently, about one in a hundred Caucasians living in the United States are resistant to HIV and carry this mutation. These mutations, and I think that um, in terms, that's not such a low number. But the, the chance of finding a cord blood that is then appropriately measured so it is available for this kind of a transplant is one of the rare, um, that rare things. Apparently, though, the team were able to identify a couple of these, which is really important as they go forward. Uh, the fact that um, this works in um, somebody, they declare, they refer to her as mixed race. Um, and I think that that could be an off-putting term, but I think it's important to understand why this matters. And that is, is that when you think about a transplant, 
you usually have to have a really good match with the donor. And um, there's, in terms of the, there's a, their donor pools around the country, they tend to not be well represented by certain communities. Um, and so this is a, um, the fact that they were able to take this opportunity to use a stem cell transplant and cord blood plus this other technology really opens, in my, to my mind, opens up this field to others similar to this um, individual uh, who would not necessarily be eligible for a, a, a more traditional transplant because there isn't um, transplant uh, um, donors available. So for the community listening at home, this is exciting. And the one thing you could do to help your community and help our communities is go um, sign up to be uh, uh, screened for uh, whether or not you wanted to be a donor of stem cells for a transplant. It's not just people living with HIV that need transplants, but lots of cancer patients need transplants. And this is something that um, we as the HIV community can definitely participate in. So Carl, in this case and two other cases that our viewers may have heard about, the, sometimes known as the Berlin patient and the London patient that have had similar procedures, these individuals were really sick with severe forms of cancer that, that required as, as uh, uh, almost last course of, of treatment, a, a stem cell transplant, which basically reconstitutes the immune system. So is this type of intervention really scalable for 37 million people around the world living with, a, with HIV? It is definitely not scalable for 37 million people. But the fact that we have other technologies growing up um, where we can go in and do gene modification or go in and take cells from an individual, make them HIV resistant and put them back is, a, is an alternative approach to this kind of really aggressive gene therapy. So there's just so many doors that this kind of progress opens toward other technologies and methods uh, to get us to a cure. Uh, we are still in the very early days of cure research but these kinds of victories are important. Um, they answer questions and pose new ones, but always there's progress. And so this brings hope um, and uh, light to um, these questions and hopefully interest so that people are more willing to consider um, donation um, uh, in the future. That's terrific. And it's also encouraging that this is the, the first woman in whom this uh, procedure has been successful. It is. It is encouraging. And it's also interesting to think about that the first two were men. And there's another patient that was identified last year at Croy called the Esperanza patient, uh, who, who's also female. And so I would say now it's two to two. Okay. Uh, okay there was not a transplant, but she is, uh, the Esperanza patient is living um, HIV free, but not through a transplant, it's through her own immunity. And so it's really interesting as we collect these, some people would call them one-offs, but in many ways they're little diamonds that we need to understand and, um, and value and figure out exactly what's going on so that we can try to replicate what we are seeing in other people living with HIV who are, are desperately ill with a, with a cancer that actually um, needs to be treated. And if you think about Timothy Ray Brown in particular, his leukemia relapsed a couple of times. He was the Ber so Berlin patient. The he's the Berlin, Berlin patient, patient, right. He's the Berlin patient. And so it's actually, if you sit back and think about that a minute, it was easier to cure his HIV than to cure him of his cancer, which just gives you a sense of how nasty and aggressive um, that type of cancer, the AML is. That, that's great. Thanks for your context on that. It's really helpful. I know the, the story has been buzzing around lots of networks and it, it's always helpful to get uh, additional details from you about these things. Moving on to our next topic, that case of remission in the absence of ART that we just discussed was in an adult, but there was another study presented at CROI exploring the possibility of uh, whether very early treatment in infants with HIV could also lead to ART-free remission. Can you tell us about that study? 
Sure. So this actually has been presented at Croy a couple of times. So uh, back in 2013, there was a case of the Mississippi baby that appeared, um, and it was a case where um, uh, Dr. Prasad and her colleagues identified a child that had uh, been treated very early in uh, infection, at the, essentially at the time of birth. Um, and then um, for a variety of reasons, which we won't get into, uh, stop therapy and in many ways fell off the grid and then reappeared and when tested um, was virus free. And this, um, this patient known as the Mississippi child um, was discussed and discussed and discussed. And then uh, in February of 2015, uh, Dr. Prasad and her team reported that in fact, the child had rebounded, but there was this period of time of, of years where the child was um, fully suppressed, not by drugs, but by whatever immune activities were going on um, in uh, the, that patient's body. So the whole purpose of the study that was presented today and here at, at Croy this week was a study called P1115, which is to try to get a group of, of infants also treated in a similar way to the Mississippi baby, get them to a point where we can consider what it would take to undergo treatment interruption if we decide to go that route. So it's, it is about replication of what of, of the Mississippi baby. So this study um, has been in the planning. It finally has um, really started to move along and it, it involves forming two cohorts, a cohort of infants that are born to um, mothers living with HIV and within 48 hours of birth, um, the children, the babies are started on any retroviral therapy, even before we know if they are uh, have acquired HIV. And then over time, we can sort them out. And only those that actually were uh, infected at the time of birth are maintained on therapy. So out of 440 kids, that babies that fit within that cohort, there were 34, 36 were identified, 34 were stayed in the study, were diagnosed um, as living with HIV. In cohort two, there were 20 um, infants that were diagnosed in utero and enrolled within 10 days of age and on, on an antiretroviral therapy. So these two cohorts have been followed over for over two years um, on therapy and going through a set of, uh, of steps to define um, how, how well suppressed they are and, and their HIV status. You mentioned two things. Uh, you mentioned the Mississippi baby presentation. I remember in, at Croy 2014 when Dr. Prasad presented that and um, HIV.gov's director Miguel Gomez had a chance to do a video interview with her. So anyone who's interested can find that on our blog. Um, and then you mentioned something else that uh, the, that child um, re remained uh, free of, of HIV without being on treatment for some number of months, but then ended up um, rebounding. So yes. touching on something that you said earlier, th that's sort of why there's this uh, longer period of time um, generally uh, established before someone is considered cured, right? Because there's always there's the concern that they may rebound and. Exactly, so that's a, a classic example of, we would say the Mississippi child was in remission um, and then rebounded. Uh, and I think that's very important to think about. So now what we have are these cohorts of children that have been well-treated. They have had to, to make several milestones along their journey to stay in the study. They had to be virally suppressed below 200 copies within 24 weeks. They had to maintain that level of suppression uh, through 40 weeks, 48 weeks. And after two years, they were assessed in terms of what was their level of HIV RNA? Are they antibody negative? And do they have any detectable HIV DNA in them? And so uh, it's interesting that what we have seen is a large, a rel I, I'm actually 
in some ways surprised that as many of the infants did as well as they did. 83% in cohort one are antibody negative and 64% in cohort one are DNA negative. That's a very impressive number. And 100% of the infants in cohort two are antibody negative and 71% are DNA negative. That leaves us um, with a prediction that approximately 30% of the original group of kids that were identified are eligible to be considered for this kind of next step. This is where parents, ethicists, physicians need to come in and talk about what it will mean to stop antiretroviral therapy in these children, watch them carefully, um, and then um, if they uh, if they fall out, if they did not have a true remission, restart therapy as soon as viral load is detectable in them. So basically we have set the table to, do, to um, undergo, to perform these um, opportunities to see if we've actually been able to create the situation or a, a status, an immune status or a antiviral status in these, uh, now I guess we could call them toddlers, um, uh, at this point, for, they're between probably two and three, or yep. maybe even a little older at this point. But really, is now the question is, we'll go through the pro. Debbie and her team, Dr. Prasad and her team, will go through a process, and in future croys, we'll be hearing about the output from P eleven fifteen. This is a really important step that was hard won through the the coronavirus pandemic, and um, we're we're getting there. And Carl, is it correct uh, to say that the sort of the theory of the case here is that with this very early treatment um, of these newborns, they may have been able to um, decrease or even perhaps eliminate, we don't know yet, the HIV reservoir, which is what where the virus hides and uh, can rebound from. That's exactly the point, Steve. That's why I made uh, the comment that so many of the, the children have undetectable levels of DNA. But I think we have to understand what that truly means because you have something called a limit of detection. There are only so many cells you can take out of a person and then say out of, to pick a number, 10 million cells, there's no HIV DNA, but there may be 10 billion cells in the body. So we don't know about those other 10 billion. Um, and so um, we're only as good as the sensitivity of the assays that we can perform, the measurements we can perform. So Carl, does this concept of uh, using very early treatment to reduce the size of the reservoir in newborns, does it possibly suggest any benefits for very early treatment of adults who have very newly acquired HIV? That's an important question. There were, there has, there's been posters at previous CROIs and there's one at this CROI that actually ask that question of if you could start people on antiretroviral therapy as soon as you knew they were um, virus positive, would that make a difference? Um, and the, the study, um, so there's a, a process of, of grading and staging people in the earliest stages of HIV infection. And I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is um, just because it's, it's, it's like a term of art. They're called the FIBIG stages. FIBIG one is the earliest, FIBIG four and five are you know, weeks um, later. Exactly. So out of this entire effort, they were able to get six people in the earliest stage of FIBIG one. And even those people who were started essentially probably within three or four days of infection had detectable DNA. Okay. So it is, now the question is over time, will an adult also clear their DNA? And I think the difference between a, a full scale adult like you or me versus an infant that is growing from a, you know, of, ideally like a three or four kilogram baby up to a 30 kilogram um, juvenile, uh, you know, five or six year old is the amount of growth of the, the immune system. And so you have two things going on in an infant. You have 
the ability of the immune system to grow and respond and also dilute out all of those cells. And so I think, you know, there's been a sense that maybe the first real true progress in cure will come from pediatrics because there's two things that we have. One is we, or a couple of things that we have going in our favor here. We know exactly when the child has become uh, infected. We know that they're going to grow and their immune systems are going to be developed. And children have something you and I don't have. We don't have a thymus left. And that is the place where T cells grow and mature and are dealt with um, and help to make a full complete immune system. So through, by being able to do these experiments very carefully and ethically in children, with children, with their parents, uh, we can make tremendous progress and then figure out how to apply that to adults. So I, I, this is where Debbie and her team are just wonderful pioneers. Thank you for that additional information. And we should point out too that both the studies that we just talked about are being conducted with support of an NIH funded um, trial group. Yes, it's, a, it's part of the impact network. The, um, and that's why they're called P1105 and P1115, P1107 and P1115. Yes. And those are all studies related to uh, maternal and infant and, and uh, pediatric uh, cases, right? It's, it's maternal, um, it's uh, women, pregnancy um, and infant of HIV, TB. Uh, it's the so huge, it's, hugely important area of research and exciting that uh, two of the key findings coming out of CROI this year are coming from that, uh, from that NIH supported group. Um, the next study, interestingly enough, also involves children, um, but it also involves a type of intervention that's been in a discussion a lot in the past year, but in the context of treating COVID-19, and that's monoclonal antibodies. So before we dig into what that study told us, can you first remind our audience what a monoclonal antibody is? Right. So we have had a lot of discussion this year about monoclonal antibodies from companies like Lilly and Regeneron that are used to treat coronavirus disease. And they were isolated from convalescent patients, uh, identified as this is a really good antibody. An antibody is just a protein that the body makes as part of their normal immune response against viruses or bacteria. Um, so what, what scientists are able to do is identify the antibody they want, go in and copy it, and then mass produce it in giant vessels of cells, mm -hmm. purify it and vial it so it can be then injected into people. And it is then monoclonal, meaning it's only one epitope, one target with on, on the virus or the, um, in the case of SARS coronavirus too, it's the antibodies target the spike glycoprotein, just like the antigen that is in all the, the vaccines. Okay. Now, what was you what we're going to talk about next are monoclonal antibodies that are directed against the HIV envelope. And they are called broad neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. And in many ways, people feel that these are a really important tool that will be an essential element of what happens for cure research and for treatment research in the future. So this is, um, this is in many ways a, a, a look into the future. And the study we're going to talk about was called the Tatello study mm -hmm. performed by Roger Shapiro and his group uh, um, using children living with HIV in Botswana. And they were able to treat children with monoclonal antibodies safely um, and in a way that really helps us to move monoclonal antibodies along so maybe now monoclonals can be part of the kind of interventions uh, that Dr. Prasad chooses to use when she goes back and looks at P1115. And I thought one of the really interesting things about Dr. Shapiro's study in, in Botswana was that the uh, children participating in the study were on ART and then at the same time were receiving the monoclonal antibody, uh, the broad, broadly neutral and the broadly neutralizing antibody or BNAB yes. um, for a period of time. And then they were able, they 
they, with the researchers and the healthcare providers, stopped treatment, um, the ART, and continued them on the BNABs. Right. There was a three parts to this study. So the children all had to meet criteria of being very well virally suppressed. Um, and then they were able to receive the broad neutralizing antibody for a period of time varying from eight weeks to 32 weeks. At that point in time, the, um, there was an agreement that the children would stop their pills and then wait for 24 weeks or until such time as they rebounded. Now, the interesting thing about this structure is that when you got out to 24 weeks, everybody restarted antiretroviral therapy. And we should explain that the, the broadly neutralizing antibodies were delivered via an infusion once every four weeks, right? So they the, each of these infants or the, the kids received six infusions. Now, the interesting thing about that is the parents loved that therapy. Um, and uh, instead of fighting on a daily basis with your child to take this medicine, um, they were able to have these six infusions. The kids were happier, the parents were happier, which is another interesting thing to think about as we go forward, not just for, and that gets back to the need, and maybe next week when we do our, our wrap up of CROI, we'll talk about long acting medications because there is something to be said for providing long acting therapy, whether it's an antibody or an antiretroviral. But these kids by and large did very well. The two antibodies that they used um, uh, worked reasonably well. And um, of, of the children, a, a percentage of them did rebound and immediately restart their therapy. Um, but even in that case, they did fully resuppress. So uh, there was uh, no significant harm, but in the, in the first cohort, the earliest cohort, 82% um, of the kids had sustained remission, but in the cohort where uh, they were received a shorter period of um, overlap, uh, there, there wasn't quite a, the great success. It was approximately 30%. So overall, um, this was, I consider this a very successful study and a proof of concept, but it tells us a couple of things we need to probably treat with antibody and antiretroviral therapy for a longer period of time before we stop therapy, but it's safe. Um, you have the buy-in from the parents in the community to do this kind of work because it gave the, the children in many ways uh, a holiday from taking pills, but not a holiday from fighting their HIV because the antibodies took over and took up the good fight. Mm -hmm. So. You know, this was, you know, it's like we're building all the pieces needed to then <clears throat> move toward um, tackling the question of, of can we induce sustained remission in children? Um, and, you know, the work of Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Prasad can come together in a way that um, we can then um, start tackling these questions in a very organized um, and uh, focused way. So one, one last question on this one, sort of going back out to the 10,000 foot level, if you will, the, the, this study and the one about the infants that we discussed earlier, they strike me as both sort of at the intersection of treatment and remission slash cure. Is, is that the correct way to think about them? I think that's exactly the, the exact correct way to think about it because you need to be virally suppressed in order to be cured. And many people think antibodies will be able to facilitate and do additional things besides just block infection in terms of promoting immunity and immune response. Um, uh, but that's a, that's a seminar all in itself. But so it, a lot of us, I think, maybe used to think of uh, treatment as like one silo and cure as a different silo of research. But I think maybe what this is telling us is they're much more closely related. I've always viewed that they were joined, that the next natural That's step- why you're the expert. <laughs> yes, the next, the, the most natural next step beyond antiretroviral therapy is antiretroviral therapy gets us to a cure. And I think the, the other interesting thing is the way we're using um, antivirals now as, as prevention and they're working so well 
that that is um, the other bridge. So the magic tool in our toolbox remains antiretroviral therapy. Great. Listen, before we close out, let's pivot and do a quick uh, prevention update at, because uh, I know that's a topic of interest to lots of our viewers. And at Croy this week, we also heard about the latest on efficacy and safety from the ongoing HPTN 083 study. Um, that one is comparing long acting injectable cavitagravir to daily oral prep. Can you tell our viewers what more we learned this week? So uh, this is an important point, is that even though um, injectable cavitagravir has received FDA approval, we are still conducting follow-up studies of uh, participants in both 083 and 084, the two studies, the women's study and the men's study, uh, um, and for um, long-term outcomes. And what we saw presented at CROI today by um, uh, Rafi Landovitz who was the PI of the study, that in fact, in the intervening year since we unblinded the study and moved everybody into understanding what they were receiving, the level of efficacy has been sustained. So we're maintaining the same level of efficacy um, between the two groups, um, the, the, the prep group, the oral prep group, and the, uh, and the injectable group. I think it's really important to understand that that means that once you tell somebody that the ther that the, the the medication they're on is effective, it really helps with adherence. It's none of this. Well, you're you're in a randomized trial. Maybe it won't work. But I think we've really figured out in some ways through the Capotegravir trial how to talk to community about what prep is and how prep um, can sustain your health. Um, and the both the pills and the the the, the TDFFTC um, combined with the injectable cabotegravir will be very important tools in our armamentarium as we move forward. And if we think about what we need to do in this country, it's working toward ending the HIV epidemic. We need all hands on deck and all means of promoting HIV prevention. And as cabotegravir injectable cabotegravir rolls out, hopefully this can get to a point where it is a well accepted, usable tool uh, by uh, uh, people who can really benefit from, from its use. Excellent. Um, it, I know that scaling up those tools will be important to both the implementing the national HIV AIDS strategy and the ending the epidemic initiative. Um, perhaps another time we'll have a conversation with you about some of the implementation research that you and your colleagues have been supporting specifically around PrEP in some of the EHE jurisdictions. Uh, but Carl, thanks so much for joining us. Um, it's been really helpful to have you share some of the important HIV research and your perspectives on it. Um, lots of stuff coming out of CROI this week. There were, I think, over 900 abstracts being presented. So it's really helpful to uh, get your take on some of the ones that were particularly significant. Um, and we're really grateful for your expertise. Thanks. Next week, we'll have a wrap up uh, where we'll um, talk about um, the things we didn't get a chance to touch based on today. That's right. We'll talk on Thursday, February 24th um, at 515 on Facebook with those additional highlights. Um, so thank you, Carl. And thank you, viewers. We appreciate you tuning in and look forward to seeing you next week.